Hello everyone, Dr. Maiden here with more requested content. So I had a, a comment from uh, a fellow YouTuber here. Uh, Sushant, you were asking about comprehensive exams. I've mentioned them, I think, a couple times very briefly in some of my PhD-themed content. And I'm here with a video today that's going to dive into a little bit more detail as to what is a comp exam. Okay, so comp exams are comprehensive exams. And these are the exams that you will take during the course of your PhD program. I am gonna speak from my experience here doing the program that I did. Um, you're gonna take them within your first uh, two to three years, um, like end of two years, if not three years, um, you're gonna start to take them. You can't take them until, in most cases, you can't take them until you've completed all the necessary coursework, right? You do coursework first, and then the comprehensive exams cap off the two to three years that you spend doing your courses. They will be written. You will absolutely have a written component, and you may have an oral component. One of my exams had an oral component, one of them did not, all right? In most cases, or in mean, all cases, they are timed. So it may be that you are given an eight hour window, a five hour window. Again, departments will differ. This is something that you can ask for. It should be, I think they often even record this like in the, the contract, in like the, your graduate student handbook. Any of that information should be made available to you. If it's not readily, readily um, findable to you, just ask around for it. Your DGS, your, your director of graduate studies, your director of doctoral studies, whoever it is that is running your program within your department, they have to give you that information. They have it for sure. So just ask um, if you can't seem to find it on your own. It's gonna be written, possibly oral, definitely timed. The window of timing can differ and it could be open. It could be closed or it could be some type of hybrid of in-between. So what I mean by open is the idea of like you could just have your stacks of books sitting all around you, have open access to them and draw on them as you write these out. OK, uh, I could even talk about, you know, like benefits and drawbacks of open versus closed. Closed would just be it's you and your your blank sheet of paper or your computer. And that's what you get. You get yourself and it just has to come right out of here. That's really, really tough. Um, in my case, I had an open one and I had a hybrid one. And so what we mean by hybrid is the fact that it wasn't technically open in the fact that I couldn't have all my books floating around me, but they let me have a citation list. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second because that is so huge to cultivate a good citation list for yourself. From my experience with both of my exams, I ended up having to answer written, I had to answer three questions. So the first one being core, or you could hear also canon, right? The canon of whatever your field is. So if it's sociology, you better believe there's a canon. For comparative politics, there's a canon. For developmental psychology, there's a canon. You will have a canon, a core list of readings. It's gonna be about theory, it's gonna be about methods. It's going to be about development of your field into the thing that it is. You will be asked a question about the canon of your discipline. The second then for me, um, drawing on um, my comparative politics, is that cross-regional question. A question that can apply anywhere and everywhere. So an example I did, I took a class where we did an example, a, a test comprehensive exam. And the example here was this very broad, open-ended question, why do men rebel, right? If, if you don't know, that's the name of a, a very classic book in the study of political conflict, um, conflict by Ted Gurr, Why Men Rebel. Uh, and so this question was just super, super short, one of the shortest comprehensive questions I've ever seen. And it was just, why do men rebel, right? It's very broad, very open-ended. You can take it a lot of different directions. It's very cross-disciplinary, or I'm not, sorry, cross-regional. The third then for a comparative politics exam is most likely gonna be you diving into your area expertise. 
So in my case, I do African politics. I know that at the same time I was taking my exam, my friend was taking it in, uh, and he specializes in Middle East, North Africa. So he had a question, I saw it on the exam because they just sent it to us all as one big uh, block. I saw his question too, and I knew that one was meant for him and the other one was meant for me, right? Um, because they, they put them all in the same Word document together. Now, depending on your department, you might get a little bit of a say in what these questions look like. I essentially formatted two of the three questions I ended up being asked for my other exam. They were much more flexible and open because it was a very interdisciplinary department. It was the Peace Studies Department at Notre Dame. It's very cross, multi, interdisciplinary. I am the only one of me that was in that department doing what I was doing. I was the first ever student brought in, I believe, under comparative politics. I was the first one that was doing African politics. No other student there had an exam that looked anything like mine because I was the only one, okay? So there's a lot of flexibility there of like, we want this exam to test you and to uh, let you show off your skills, but you need to help us a little bit because we don't know what it is that you do, right? So there was a, a lot more flexibility to me, for me to walk into that exam feeling more confident than the other one because I had been preparing myself for the questions that I was asked. And that was huge in terms of confidence. So the biggest tip that I have for you, whether you're allowed to have open book, open book is great, but I, I hinted at the idea of mm, some benefits and drawbacks. I noticed the difference in terms of the speed at which I wrote and the confidence with which I wrote for my closed exam or my, high, my almost closed exam compared to that open exam. Because I wasted a lot of time with the open exam trying to find new information or trying to pour back over the books, right? I, I, felt, I felt like I was doubting myself more than I needed to have been doubting myself. Um, and I think part of it was that it was an open exam. And so I had, I had the piles, right? They were all around me. They were all over the piles of my books. And I kept going back to them rather than relying on the work that I had already done to prep myself. Um, and that slowed me down. And I could, I noticed that I was doing it, but then it's that feeling of like, but I can't stop because what if I'm wrong? I need to double check it, right? With the hybrid exam, all I got was a curated list that I made of citations. And this, whether you go open or closed, if you can have a curated list, make a list. It is a godsend, okay? So what I'm talking about here is basically a quick action reference list that you can have, have it as a Word doc if you're, you're most likely going to be typing your comprehensive exam answer, have it as a doc that's open and copy and paste, copy and paste over. So I'm going to give you an example here. I had prepped, you know, in, in political conflict, a big question is what causes civil war? That's a big question. I had already gotten asked the question, why do men rebel? So I was like, like, let's be ready for something similar to this. What causes civil war? I had gone through all the literature in my prep and I had nine causes cited in scholarship. There's probably more. These were the nine that I was ready to go with. So I could just walk down the list. I had my, re my reference list ready. So if I wanted to talk relative deprivation, I had it. Gurr, Scott, Collier and Sambanis. Ethnic Division, Kaplan, Toft, Posen, Furin, Mkandawiri, Greed, Collier and Hoffler, Gamson, Kaliabas, Humphreys and Weinstein, Mountainous Terrain. You can't talk about Mountainous Terrain in Civil War without talking about Furon and Leighton. I had it all ready to go on the sheet. So as I was typing, I could just copy paste, copy paste my citations. Because there is going to be an expectation, you've got to cite your work. So this is a really golden way for you to feel very prepared is curate that list so that you can just go and say, who talks about democratization? Boom. Who defined civil war? Boom. And have that nice two to three to four, or however many citations you want. So you're just throwing the citations at them of like, I know what I'm talking about and I know that they talked about it first. Okay. So a uh, citation list, do it. I think the question that's important that Sushant was asking was, what happens if you don't pass? Okay, 
I know more than one person in my department that did not pass their comprehensive exam on the first time. It can happen. Things can happen. You can have an off day. You can misinterpret the question. You can answer it and it's just not good enough. It's not a good enough answer. It's not a strong enough answer and you might not pass. If you did not pass, you could try again. So they may have a time limit for you of how long you have to go before you're allowed to try again. They may have some type of stipulation of a class that you have to take or something, you know, because they, they don't want you to fail and it would be devastating for them to have to fail you, but there, there's going to be a reason if they failed you. And in most cases, because it'll be a committee that reviews it and they provide you with feedback. Um, they will provide you with feedback on your answers. They'll tell you if, like in the case of my one question, they were very clear of like, this is a low pass, almost no pass for me. But I got through, right? It's like, if you can get through, so that one question, and I knew it was dodgy as I was doing it. I was like, oh, this is just, let's just do it. Just do it and move on. I, it was weird. It was about like time. And it, anyway, it was the lesser of two evil questions for me. And I was pregnant at the time. It was, it was tough, guys. Uh, it was a low pass, almost no pass, but I was like, I'll take it, right? <laughs> so with my other questions, it was okay. And with my other exam, I did really well on my other exam when I wasn't pregnant and starving and shaking and, you know, so whatever, take it, okay? Um, you just need to be, you just need to look at your policies for your department. What happens if I don't pass? Can I take this again? When can I take it again? What happens if I don't pass? then. And you should find that the faculty in your department are going to be supportive of you. Um, it happens, right? And the, the thing that I would say is like, no one needs to ever know that it did happen to you, right? People in your department might know, like right now I'm talking about it. I know that this happened to, to a friend of mine, um, but no one else ever has to know. It will never come up again, right? It doesn't go on a transcript. You don't ever have to bring it up in a job interview. No, I have, I have never, except for Sushant, right? And because I'm providing this information to you guys, no one has ever, ever, ever asked me about my comprehensive exams, even though they're such a foundational part of the PhD. Um, so don't worry about it. If you don't pass, double down, get a better, stronger citation list, really, really go over core and methods and make sure that you feel as strong as possible. I think in most cases that's where people stumble and they don't write the strongest answer possible is in core and methods or in the broadly um, generalized questions. Because when it gets down to the heart, when it's the area questions, your, spe your specific expertise questions, I mean, if you're like me, you can talk for days about the things that interest you the most. Comparative methods, like hard methodology, temporal time management and strategy or whatever the question was that's not my jam right and so it was really tough but you want to talk about African politics you want to talk about why men rebel you want to talk about civil war I will give you pages right so focus if you're anything like me focus on core focus on methods and really feel like to the best of my ability I'm ready to answer a broad question about the theory of my discipline, the methods of my discipline, the historical development of specific concepts within my discipline. The last thing, because I don't want this to be too long, is you might even have a department that's super wonderful. It could be that your grad students host it. It could be that your department hosts it. My, my one discipline, they kept a running list. Whenever we finished our exams, we put them into a Dropbox folder. And so all of the questions, all of the answers that we gave students would, um, the students were the ones that were running it. We would submit them to each other, right? If you've watched a couple of my other videos, I talk about this, how to survive grad school. I say, seek, seek out this information, ask other grad students. And if there's not some type of repository of here's all of the former questions, like test bank questions that we've asked, or here's my answers, just ask. Ask students that are higher up and say, would you be willing to show me your comprehensive exam answers? Or if not the answers, would you be willing to show me the questions? 
all you can do is ask. That's all you can do. And maybe they're going to be cagey and weird about it and say no. I think that's weird. I feel like if you got through that open door, you hold it open with your body, right? Hold door. Hold the door open. Let other people come in behind you. If I can help you, I will. I hope this is helpful. If you have any other questions about comprehensive exams, please just let me know.